The Flow of History, a Taiwanese game by Blaze Region by Mo Ideas, but I received it through TMG, so I assume that TMG is distributing it on the side of the planet. The Flow of History is a Euro game slash civilization game, which feels a little abstract at first when you look at the mechanics, but then naturally uh, shows to have a surprising degree of meat when it comes to the various cards and effects that represent the ages through which the game will lead the players. Like in many other civilization games, you start from uh, pretty much the Stone Age and you get to the present, you get to uh, modern political systems, technologies and so on and so forth. Uh, three to five players, so with four players probably being the soft spot, it plays in about an hour once you're familiar with the mechanics and most importantly with the effects again. Various cards uh, will do different things in different ages, there's particularly powerful cards. When they come out, players want to take a, take a minute to realize the implications of that card. Once you're familiar with those, so you know more or less what to expect in a certain age, the game will certainly shorten in length, but expect the first game to last probably around 90 minutes rather than 60 it will get shorter later, in, 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 after you play it a while. Let me show how the flow of history works. Each player in the game has a cute pawn such as this one, which is used to make investments. Each player also has a matching player aid. It's very useful, it summarizes, I would say, 80% of the rules of the game, and also uh, it allows you to see who is the owner of each pawn when the pawns will be placed on the cards to, to, develop, them, to develop them. These are resources and there is a general reserve. Then there will be resources that will be moved into another area. It's important to keep it separate and this here is called the supply. Very important technical term because there are effects that target the reserve and other effects that target the supply. And then players will also have some resources, hopefully, in their personal personal pool, their personal bank. Players all start with one of these starter cards uh, representing the very foundation of their civilization. And during the game, players will acquire cards from that area, the market. The cards come out of the stack here, which is divided in different ages to represent uh, history, develops, new technologies are found, and also old technologies become obsolete. If there are cards in the market that uh, belong to ages before the current one, those are removed. So for example, if there is an age one card, when age, when age three cards are out, then the age one cards are discarded. Now, uh, what do you do during the game? Well, you will acquire cards and you will form a tableau in front of you using those cards. Those cards are pretty interesting. They have a lot of interesting symbols. There's a symbol here in the top left corner indicating the type of card that the card is for game effects. Here you have an icon which is called the Investor Bonus and it applies when you acquire the card, when you develop the card, you invest it on the card and then you develop it. It's a two-step process. First you invest on a card, then you develop it. When you develop it, you are the investor and then you score, uh, you score points. Actually, you collect resources based on that icon and pretty much that tree is triggered by other icons of that type. For example, if I'm acquiring this card here as the investor and I have this card here that has this icon, then I get a resource because the investor bonus gives me a resource because I have another icon. As you collect cards, you stack them together based on their on their color or symbol that also represents the type and you also take advantage of the text that are currently visible. When you get multiple cards of the same color, you stack them so that the icons are still visible, so that applies to investor bonuses and other game effects, but now only the text on top, the text is actually visible, applies. So after a while, your uh, area may start looking like this. You have these yellow cards that represent leaders. So you may only have a leader at a time. If you acquire a new one, you discard the old one. And finally, you have wonders. Wonders, you may have multiple ones and they don't stack, so their effects remain available for the rest of the game 
or until somebody uses an effect to destroy your wonder so basically the effect remains in play for as long as the card is in play but again at the beginning of a turn the market will look like that with five available cards now when it is your turn, you can perform one of the following actions. You may invest, that is, you start developing one of the cards. You place the pawn on a card that you like, you want to invest on, and you place any number of resources on that, on, on that card. This is, well, important. And that's all that happens for that, for that, uh, for the time being in that action. Next, Another action that you can take, you can take it next turn, but it can be a, also a later turn, you develop that card. So you have completed that card, what happens is that you remove all of the resources that you had invested there and you place them in the supply, you get your pawn back and you acquire the card. So again, you check the investor bonus. Then after you check this is the symbol here, which represents an effect that may an instant effect. Other cards here have an effect which is permanent. They should call it continuous because it's not necessarily there until the end of the game. I guess it's permanent for as long as the card is out there. So how is that permanent? Um, so some effects are instantaneous, in which case you apply them when you acquire the card. And then once you acquire the card, you stack it or you place it in your area according to the rules. So these are pretty intuitive things, right? You invest and then in a later turn, you get the card and you pay the, and you pay the, um, the money that you invested there. And you get the bonuses again from the investor bonus and then whatever effect is there that may apply at that point. There are attack effects which are particularly neat because they allow you to damage the opponent if you have more attack icons than they have attack plus defense icons. So make sure that your defenses are good because when the players start purchasing those cards and activating the instant effects that allow them to attack you, it can get pretty annoying. Now you may wonder, why did I invest a lot of money there? Um, why don't I just invest one every time when I'm trying to develop a card? Well, because there is another effect which is called sniping. Haha. <laughs> Instead of investing or completing a card, you may snipe the card of an opponent. That means, of course, that your cards can be sniped by other players. To snipe a card, you target a card uh, that is being invested but not completed yet and you need to have enough resources to match the number of resources that has been placed there. So first, here it gets a little complicated and abstract, but after a couple of times that you do it, it will work easily. First, you pay the same amount that was invested directly to the player that has invested. In this case, I will give these three resources to the orange player. Then you move all the resource tokens that are there from the invested card to the supply. There is also a chance then that the investor may get some extra, some extra resources if the investor has this icon here. It's a trading icon which again activates when somebody is sniping a card from you. And at the end, the investor counts the amount of resources that are in the supply and the investor that just lost a card takes half of those rounded down. So it's pretty neat. By placing a lot of resources there, you make it less likely that somebody will snipe it from you. You check how many resources other people have and then you decide, yeah, okay, nobody can match this. Or uh, at least you make them pay dearly if you decide to, uh, to invest a lot on a resource on a, a lot of resources on a card. And finally, the sniper gets this card. Pretty much after the investor got a lot of resources, a lot of consolation prizes, the sniper finally gets the card that was sniped. Which means uh, you may have realized sometimes you want other players to get to start investing on a certain card that you want so you can snipe it from them. Yes, it's expensive to snipe stuff, but it allows you to get a card in a single round because to go through the process of investing and then completing, it takes two rounds. But if I want that card the next time I go and chatting, doing diplomacy, convince you orange player to invest there, then this turn I'm gonna pay, but I'm gonna take it from you directly. So sniping also has the effect of getting cards in your hand a little faster than if you're investing and then completing. 
Some cards have special actions on them that requires a turn action to activate. That means that to use that action, do uh, that action, and I can't find a single one. To use that action, you need to spend your action for that turn. So you're not investing, sniping, or doing other things. There you go. This will be one of them. To use this action, then you spend your turn. You use you, you, your one action per turn to activate that, that action there. Other action, finally, you can harvest. When you harvest, and it's good to do when the supply has a lot of stuff. First, if you take the harvest action, you will add supplies based on the number of, uh, of agriculture icons that you have. So more may be added there. And then you take half of the resources in the supply, round it down. So, well, a good way of getting money quickly, or getting resources quickly, if you're short on cash. These are the basic ideas. These are the basic ideas. You continue like this until the deck is depleted. Players will have a nice tableau. There is a different cycle of actions that happen in later, in later eras. You get events that are more powerful, have greater magnitude. I'm not going to tell you what they are, so I'm not giving you spoilers, but it's fun to see how civilizations go from humble beginnings to getting pretty much weapons that allow them to annihilate each other. Continue like this until the end of the game. At the end of the game, culture icons, which are these icons here, are worth a victory point. Each other icon is worth half a point. And remember, the effects on the cards get covered, but the icons remain. So simply to have a sheer blunt number of, of icons, a lot of them is good, but you really score a lot of points if you get a lot of culture icons, either from cards that have the culture icon directly printed on them. Like in this case, yay me, one point here, half and half is two points. Or by using other cards that give you culture icons by fulfilling certain other conditions. The player with the highest total at the end of the game is the winner of the game. This game pleasantly surprised me. The mechanics seem so terribly abstract. I remember reading the manual more times than I thought I would. When I first saw the manual, I was okay, this is a fairly simple game, uh, the rules are not long. And then somehow just to put those concepts in my, in my head took me longer than I expected. There is something about the rules as presented in the rule book that feels a little dry and a little, and a little abstract. Although the rule book is serviceable, it gets the job done. I learned the game, my, my friends learned it, so it was possible to do so. Something about it just felt... Uh, Again, just very dry, very, I don't know. I don't know why it was a little hard to figure out gameplay from the rules. The rules were simple to learn, but putting them in together into a coherent picture took me a while. But then when I started playing the game, the game was flowing well. The flow of history, uh, well, I think it captures, it captures how the game works quite nicely. Although to get to that flow point, you do have to spend some time familiarizing yourself with the with the cards. There are some cards later on extremely powerful, from atomic bombs, uh, powerful political leaders like Gandhi, and those really alter the situation. So you have to become familiar with those. And once you are, I don't think that really the replayability of the game is reduced because within each age, you still have a lot of variety. You kind of get a sense of what may get out there. And so that will give you some direction and will save you time. So you don't have to read about, read every card and think about it every time without, I think, compromising the surprises and the twists and the different situations that will emerge based on different order in which the cards will come out of the deck in each, uh, within each age, at each, each time that you play the game. As for the mechanics themselves, there are a couple of things that I really like. In particular, this dilemma between sniping and investing and later developing, later completing a card, which seems to be the safe thing to do, but if you can snipe things from other players, well, then you just get more stuff, you get more cards. Ultimately, you win the game by having a lot of icons, which means a lot of cards. So all of the things being equal, sniping seems to be better than 
then investing all this that's what everybody was trying to do so the game turned out to have a fairly surprising element of diplomacy as you know we were i would tell, tell player b look player a is ahead so if you don't get that car player is gonna do that thing which is gonna be terrible for everybody and look that car seems to be useful to you anyway so why don't you we gang together against player a it was just a trick to get player b to invest on that car so i could snipe it right away and it worked an ungodly number of times. I don't know how player B didn't see that coming. Uh, I'm happy we need to play more together, player B. I'm not saying your name, but you know who you are. Uh, by the way, I still lost the game in which I was using this technique. So that's not all that there is. But the diplomatic element, manipulating other people, trying to invest and get things... Uh, that ultimately will benefit you is definitely part of the game on top of the fact that there will probably be honest diplomacy there will be honest times in which two players do gang up against somebody to uh, put together a powerful attack etc 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 now uh, there is a little bit of a I don't know if it's four X's but some X's definitely are here maybe not the explore the X of exploration in 4X games but definitely the exterminate element you can do a lot of damage if you invest on military power and if the opponents neglect building defenses which creates an interesting trade-off because since the beginning there are a lot of nice cards that give you all those delicious cultural icons that will score you a lot of points at the end of the game but if you invest on those only you will get ahead early on which is bad in a variety of ways first because you have developed your cultural icons and you neglected defenses so now it's easier for the opponents to attack you on top of that you attracted attention so the opponents have all possible incentives to indeed exploit your defenses and bash you from all directions so there is that nice trade-off i'm building my defenses and i'm building an army and now I don't have many other resources they can use for culture for cultural icons because it's not just about resources, it's about the number of turns, which is limited. Of course, I invest a lot on cultural icons, they're gonna be taken away from me. So there's a nice balance there that you have to find. Another balance is between, I would say, the tactical element, which is um, what is on the market right now, what players are doing that I'm reacting to, but definitely, definitely, definitely never forget the strategic, the long-term element, which actually may even be uh, more important. It really is about planning ahead. If you want to get a lot of culture points at the end without necessarily attracting a lot of attention, you get some wonders that will trigger an effect at the end that will give you a lot of culture icons if you meet certain requirements. So the long-term strategy is to get those wonders and then to work on building the, the engine of resources that will give you those requirements that allow you to meet the requirements at the end. So definitely long-term strategy and I think, I think this is very important because there are times so there are times like in the early game, middle of the game, when players may lose sight of that thing. Okay, I got a resource and then he got, I got a card and then it was covered by another card. So now it turned into an icon that I don't necessarily use very much. I got a leader, that's great. And then next turn I get another leader that sends this one to retire. So what was the point? Sometimes you do get the sense that uh, the game may, may lose direction and they're just collecting cards and going through motions for no particular reason but I would say that only happens if you have neglected the long-term strategy if you lose sight of the fact that the game is about scoring at the end having like a big scoring pile at the end so I would say there is one negative thing that or at least something I need to um, put a caveat there about about this game is the fact that it doesn't although the there is a progression from age to age with different resources and things that you can build and leaders it does feel like slightly flat in the sense of progression it does feel it's more like a flow than than a peak it's more it really feels like the flow of a river uh, there is a certain repetitive element which is not necessarily negative if, again, you have the long term in mind and you're building towards a strategy and building a certain momentum to attack somebody and building a certain momentum to attack somebody else or protect, against some, protect yourself against something, collect a certain resource, but it may feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again and 
and you may lose sight of the objectives in that case uh, the attention of the players may decrease just make sure that everybody knows that even in the early phases you acquire cards and most likely you will not have at the end of the game or we will not really matter much at the end of the game but they still matter because they allow you to build stuff that in mid game will give you the stuff that at the end of the game will really matter so keep that in mind and and then you're more likely to see that the players remain uh, focused on the game they don't get distracted the attention is high and they get to enjoy the fact that the game has an architecture this being said, again, it's an architecture that feels a little understated, it's easy to miss, and even when you see the connection from age to age, from car to car, for small resources, to intermediate resources, and the term resources, still I think that the game could be a little shorter. The game could benefit from being 10-15 minutes shorter. Um, and maybe it can be done simply by taking out some cards from each age. I don't think that would be quite it. I mean, I don't think you can just do it randomly. That would probably obsess some inner balances of, well, then you have some cards in the last stage that cannot be easily acquired because you took away those resources. I would say, I think, I would say that there would need to be play tests. You would need to experiment on which cards you can take out to reduce the deck, shorten the length of the game, and still have a balanced gameplay experience. But I wouldn't mind if the game was a little shorter. That may be probably my the only minus that I have. The previous one was a caveat because it doesn't have to be a minus. Uh, I think the game would be more interesting, uh, more intense, more incisive if you have a slightly shorter gameplay. Not a deal breaker in any means, not a big problem. I still enjoy the game, I still want to play it in the future. And maybe again, the more you play it with the same people, the faster it gets, then maybe also the length will feel more right. In any case, the flow of history, a game that feels dry and abstract when you learn it, it feels dry and abstract when you play it at least the first time, and then it may grow on you. It definitely grew on me and definitely started enjoying it, seeing the design, seeing the architecture. Give it a couple of tries, I think some players may miss what the game is about if they only try it once, and may just feel like, take a card, throw a card, put a card in front of me, and etc. etc. It may feel repetitive and flat, but it isn't, it's just that the sense of progression is somewhat not all that easy to see, but once you see it, I think that you have a fine game here. The decisions are interesting, the diplomacy is interesting, the various connections of the effects and the balance that you have to find in collecting the right resources, the right time, based on what other players have, all of these things are interesting and definitely uh, come together well to make an interesting design. One that may not be for everybody, may not be for all, for all palettes, but I enjoyed it and I think there are many players out there, the Euro crowd especially, that will enjoy this game. Flow of history, distributed, I believe, by TMG, or, I don't know, look on their website, I think that's, that's where you'll find information on how to get this game. Flow of history, it's a good game.